Nope, not yet. Well, hey, good day there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Typewriter Video Series. This is Joe. Hey, uh, you guys might remember a few videos ago, a few weeks ago, in fact, I uh, made a trip over to Phoenix, Arizona for their summer 2018 type-in. And I came away with a Smith Cronus Skywriter, and it didn't have a case. So on the way back, we stopped off at a, a little uh, antique thrift store, and I got this uh, little light blue Samsonite travel case that I use now to carry the Skywriter in. Uh, also, I will use it in a smaller carrying bag. Let's do a review of the Smith Cronus Skywriter, shall we? Well, as you might know, if you've been following uh, typewriters and the Typosphere and maybe the Facebook Antique Typewriters group, you might know that the Smith Cronus Skywriters have gotten pretty popular as a well-regarded ultra-portable typewriter. And uh, I think they do earn that reputation indeed. This particular Skywriter is from circa 1962 from the serial number database and it is made in England according to the nameplate here. The earlier Skywriters of the 1950s had the textured paint finish uh, very much in the same style of the five, Super 5 series like the Silent and Silent Super of that era. This though has a uh, shinier paint finish and a little bit slightly different body style. It has the SCM Smith Corona Marchant uh, badge here on the ribbon cover, whereas the older one, the 1950s version, has more of a sculpted inlaid Smith Corona badge. So this was a little bit later in the production series of the Skywriters, but uh, I, I like it. It's a pretty cool typewriter. Now this particular Skywriter, this era of Skywriter, has the longer carriage return lever and what this brings to mind is uh, recently just this last week uh, Ted Monk on his blog had an article about swapping out the short carriage return levers of the earlier Skywriters for the longer carriage uh, return levers of similar machines such as the Smith Corona Cougars and those kind of typewriters. And if you remember a few months back, I had a light blue a Smith Corona Cougar that I reviewed. I didn't uh, think it was well regarded in my mind in terms of build quality. Uh, but there was a lot of similarities in design that you can see evolutionarily from, is evolutionarily a word? From this Smith Corona Skywriter era, you can see where they took the design and kind of cheapened it up. It had a lot of the similar characteristics of it. So we're going to do a little review of the Smith Corona Skywriter from the early 1960s. Well, let's get on to it, shall we? Well, let's start off with the keyboard. Well, if you have one of the older Skywriters from the 1950s with the uh, textured paint uh, finish, you might think that its uh, build quality is very similar to the Super 5 series. One of the ways in which this typewriter differs, though, from the Super 5 series is, for instance, the key travel on the for Super 5 series, the key tops remain parallel, remain flat during the entire travel of the key, whereas this is more of a conventional key travel the keys pivot down and they they become non-horizontal as they move down in their travel. You might see it better with a cue there. So it's more of a conventional keystroke system. Um, this particular typewriter though has half spacing. So the carriage moves half a space when you push this space bar down and another half space when you release it. So that is different from the Super 5 series, which were a single space machine. This particular keyboard, of course, is the uh, traditional American style keyboard, uh, the older style lacking the number one uh, and lacking the plus symbol. One thing I really like about Smith Corona and a lot of the other models of this era was, for some reason, I really like having the backspacer on the right side. Uh, some keyboards put them on the left and they put the margin release on the right. I really like, the, like it on the right. That's my own personal preference, but it seems to work pretty well for me. So the Skywriter is a carriage shift machine, but the force required to shift it is not excessively high. And you might notice that the shifting action is more of a pivoting. It's kind of just raising up 
raising the front of the carriage up. And in some regard, this is similar to the uh, French-made Roy typewriter that you might have remembered from a few weeks ago. So you're not really lifting the full weight of the carriage. It is a small diameter platen. It's roughly, it looks like 7 eighths of an inch diameter. And so it's about the same size as the Roy uh, uh, platen uh, roller itself. Okay, let's look at the right side of the carriage. We have the platen knob here. And of course, with like a lot of ultra portables, there's only a, a carriage release lever on the right side, the right hand side, which is right here. And this lever right here is the tension release for the pressure rollers. You can see this pan right here moves forward moves up when you release the tension on the rollers. And a pretty traditional press down and slide margin settings. And also it has the uh, rabbit ear style uh, paper supports back here. Now this particular paper support on my machine when I got it, this bracket here was bent forward so that the paper support was coming up almost vertically and it was essentially made it unusable. But in the process of servicing it, I bent it back more to what I think it should be the normal angle. Okay, uh, so here's the paper bale and it is a traditional kind of a ultra portable style paper bale. It's flat and uh, has the letter scale on the uh, front of it. As I indicated, this is a made in England Skyrider. Here's your lowercase Skyrider logo. On the back of the machine, you have the uppercase graphics Smith Corona logo. And of course, you can see the back of the telescoping paper support with the little spring that uh, operates that. And uh, it's, it's kind of a nicely uh, shaped, rounded, modernist looking typewriter. I really do like the, sh the looks of it. Um, even though it doesn't have the textured finish of the earlier versions, I think it's pretty neat. Let's go around to the left-hand side of the carriage. Okay, the first thing you'll notice to inboard of the hinge point of the carriage return lever is this uh, lever right here. And this is really for centering the carriage and for storage. So if you push the carriage a little to the left and then you push this down and let it go out, it stops at a predetermined centering point determined by this lever, but it's not actually locking the typewriter carriage at all. What holds the typewriter carriage is going to be your escapement, which tells you that it's not really safely holding the carriage uh, for storage. Uh, you have to make sure that the carriage is secured. Okay, so there is a sliding lever right here that goes between single line spacing and double line spacing, as you might be able to see there. It's one click and two clicks right there. Now there is another lever function which is down here. My, on this, my machine this does not work because the little lever, the tip of the lever is broken off, but this was intended to release the tension on the uh, ratchet gear so you can slip the carriage, slip the paper when you're typing in forms. Mine doesn't work, but that's not a big deal for me because I rarely use that feature at all. Uh, as I indicated earlier, there is no uh, carriage release lever on the left platen knob, but that's common with a lot of ultra portable typewriters. This typewriter does have the end of page system, uh, the numbering built onto the left uh, end of the platen roller, as is common with a lot of Smith Coronas of this era. It's a feature I don't really use that often, but if you need to use it, it's pretty handy. Okay, so the uh, ribbon cover hinges up. You simply pull up the front of the cover, and there is a little lever system here that engages into a, a notch down in here on the front, like that. And I found that it helps to sometimes uh, slightly bend this lever to get, a, to get it to be not too tight and not too loose so that you can simply pull up on the ribbon cover and it opens up like that. Uh, there is a touch adjustment on the left side here and it does make a difference in the way it feels. Uh, I actually currently like using it on the lowest setting, but it goes uh, low up to two, three, four, five, and then high. So there is some adjustment range, which means the 
the system, the tension system does is working somewhat. It uses a felt kind of a support pad f underneath the type bars at the rest position. And uh, so you want to just make be careful of that when you are cleaning the type slugs. Make sure you don't get too much alcohol in there because it could loosen up the glue attaching those fibers. Okay, the biggest uh, thing I think about this typewriter that you need to think about before you get one of these is it uses non-standard uh, spools, smaller diameter than the universal replacement spools. These spools, these plastic spools, are the ones that I that came with the machine when I got it, and I re-spooled a blue ribbon from a universal style spool, and I used maybe two thirds or three quarters of that ribbon. So this spool won't hold the full 16 yards of a ribbon that a standard spool will. It's a little bit less. You might actually be able to use those adding machine spools, the substandard diameter adding machine spools. I haven't tried them, but I think they might work. But anyways, it is a slightly non-standard spool, and that's one thing to consider when you do get replacements for it. It does have a ribbon reversing system. There is a slotted guide that the, the ribbon goes through, and they pivot back and forth like that to operate the uh, reversing system. And being as how this is an ultra portable, this does not have a bichrome setting. It's a single color setting. So there's no real point in getting a, a black red ribbon, for instance. It's a standard monochrome type of setting. It has these two little guides up here that operate as sort of card, card guides for typing on cards, but you could also put a pencil or a pen in the corner of the hole and use it to draw lines with if you wished. Now, the condition of this machine was a little dirty and a little rough, and you might still be able to see in the little machined semicircle down here, just above the slots of the segment, it looks kind of discolored and mottled, and it really does look like some kind of corrosion has been happening on this metal. But it also looks like the metal was not finished to a smooth, finely machined surface. It looks almost like uh, a casting that was left rough and not machined down. And I don't know if that's the case or if it just corroded over the years due to the presence of some acidic environment or whatever. But anyway, even these front surfaces uh, between the slots of this segment have this kind of mottled corrosion that doesn't seem to come off very well. And I also tried cleaning it with uh, Neverdoll, which is a uh, metal polish and it doesn't really work all that well. It doesn't really take much of the corrosion off. But needless to say, it's actually a pretty good little typing machine and it probably is well deserved of the reputation. One of the features I'll show you is this little vertical piece of metal between the underneath the uh, type guide. That's the spring that dampens the, the, the force of the type bar hitting the platen. Okay, I'm going to put the microphone over by the carriage so we can Kind of hear the sound of the typing. Let's thread up a sheet of paper. This machine uh, threads the paper fairly smoothly. Uh, the feed rollers do seem to work pretty good. And I'm going to be typing kind of sideways here, so we'll see if I can do it. It is a nice, quiet typewriter. Uh, very quiet for being an ultra portable. And of course, I like the blue ribbon. This is an elite font machine, 12 characters per inch, and so you have to be able to get used to that particular size of font, but I really like it. The only adjustments I've had to really make were to the letter A. The letter, I should say, was printing a little bit high. Where is it? Oh, the lazy. And I have it pretty close now to being right. Um, the letter alignment isn't absolutely perfect, but it's pretty close. The upper lowercase alignment is pretty good too. Uh, this last set is left uh, shift, right shift, and then left shift lock. So they're all pretty well aligned, and uh, though that's been good. Uh, this machine uses a common shifting system between both the left and the right. So when you use the right shift key, the left shift key also goes down, indicating that it's operating a common shift linkage mechanism. This also has a manual ribbon reverse system. This manual lever on the right side operates the ribbon reverse manually if you need to do that. Okay, I indicated earlier this was a half space machine and uh, 
one of the benefits, or probably the only real benefit to that, is in the case of when you've already typed a sentence, but you missed a letter. So this middle letter should be the word test. It should have four letters instead of three. And the way you can do this is you first erase those unwanted letters, and then you move the printing position so you're on the T, and then you press and hold the space bar, release it, press it, and then while you're pressing, you do the T, and then you press, uh, you release the space bar, press it again, and type the E, release the space bar, press and hold again, type the S, release it, press it again, and type the T, and what you've done is you've borrowed a half space between the first two words and you borrowed a half space from between the second two words and those two half spaces you've made room for an extra letter. So this is a way of inserting missing letters using the half space feature which is real handy when you don't feel like retyping the whole document. So this is a pretty nice little typeface as I indicated. Let me uh, do the test typing of the whole keyboard for you. And it is a nice typeface. After I got this machine home from Phoenix, I had to service it. It had a number of issues. Uh, the type bars were really grungy and dirty. Basically, the whole machine needed to be thoroughly degreased and cleaned. But the platen was pretty hard, and uh, the pressure rollers were also hard. They weren't gripping the paper very well. So I had to take the platen out and access the, the pressure rollers, and I discovered it wasn't really that hard to take the chassis out of the body and to take the uh, platinum pressure rollers out. Let me show you how you do it. So what you want to do to remove the chassis from the body of the typewriter is in the front of the typewriter underneath both shift buttons are is a, no a bracket with a notch and there has this protrusion sticking out through the back of the notch and that uh, notch is or that protrusion is part of the chassis so you're going to want to slide the chassis backwards so that you can remove this protrusion from the slot and then you'll pull the chassis up. And to do that you have to loosen a couple screws. One of those screws is underneath the right side of the carriage. This flat screw, pan head screw with a star washer, you're going to remove that. And underneath the left side of the carriage there is also a screw with a star washer. You're going to remove that. And this will free up the chassis to be removed from the body of the typewriter. Keep in mind the older Skywriters might not have the star washer. They just might be a standard screw by itself. And after those two screws have been removed you want to open up the ribbon cover and then you can slide the chassis back so those two protrusions are free of the slot and then you can remove the chassis itself. Once the chassis is free of the typewriter body, it's fairly easy to remove the platen to get to the uh, escapement, and it really gives you good access to the escapement. So on the right platen knob, there's a set screw. You're going to want to loosen that, and that will enable you to pull off the right knob. You want to lift up the paper bale. And then we go to the left side, where we also have a set screw that we have to loosen up that enables us to pull off the left platen knob. Now what we want to do is free the platen for removal from the typewriter and the remaining thing you have to do is this cog that does the line spacing there's a roller underneath that cog right here and that roller is on an arm and the screw that holds the arm is right back here to the left of the paper pan and you want to loosen that screw, not take it completely off, but loosen that screw. That will enable this roller to disengage itself from this sprocket. And once you do that, you can pull the platen to the right and up. And when you do that, be aware, there is a small little curved washer that has to fit onto the end of the platen in there. So be sure you don't lose that. Once the platen has been removed, then if you take the spring, on the back of this paper pan, if you remove the top of the spring here and disconnect it from this slot, this whole paper pan removes where the pressure rollers are, and that gives you full access to the escapement underneath the machine. 
Well, you might ask the question, where, Joe, would you place the Skyrider in the pantheon of ultra-portable typewriters? Well, keeping in mind that my experience is really only with uh, this one intimately, and uh, my friend Kevin has an earlier 50s version of Skyrider, um, I would say that I think I like the construction quality of the Skyrider better than the Hermes Rocket. It's only slightly bigger than the Hermes Rocket. It is a nice typewriter. I think the feel of the keys, the action on this typewriter really is superior to most other ultra portables. I think the Olympia SF that I have, the early SF, is comes pretty close to the touch of this machine. The Olympia is a little bit slightly heavier touch and it's a slightly heavier and bigger machine, but the touch has a certain feel about the Olympia that is hard to compare, but it's pretty nice. I do like this Skywriter an awful lot though. Keeping in mind this particular sample is a elite font 12 character per inch machine. Yeah, I really like this. It, it is one of the best uh, ultra portable certainly. Um, as far as the condition of it, I touched on that earlier. Uh, I had to do a lot of cleaning in the, uh, in the segment to get the uh, type bars from hanging up. A lot of degreasing and scrubbing. And I took off this platen three times uh, to adequately service it and the escapement underneath. So that's the reason why I didn't show you actual demonstrate how to take it apart. I didn't want to take it apart a fourth time. This spring that you have to disconnect behind the center of the paper pan where the pressure rollers are, um, I've had to reshape the top, the top loop of that spring. If it's not shaped properly, you won't get quite the right tension on the pressure rollers. So yeah, you have to limit how often you mess with these machines. Uh, so they have a limited service lifetime. Anyways, I really think it's one of the best ultra portables that I've certainly uh, personally had experience with. Now I have not experienced every typewriter out there. So I look forward to having more experiences with portable, ultra portable typewriters. And I hope you guys have an opportunity also to find yourself a Smith Corona Skywriter or equivalent. Well, this is Joe. I hope this was helpful to you. The Smith Corona Skywriter, a very popular typewriter these days for those who are desiring an ultra portable typewriter with good quality build and good haptics, good touch and feel. Well, until next time, you guys have yourselves a great day.